it's Tommy Allen for TommyAllenMusic.com. Welcome. This week we have Alan White, a photographer who loves the blues. Come and check it out. Thank you very much, Alan. It's a pleasure. Let's start back. How long have you done photography for? Uh, most of my life. But the late, I can't remember when I started. Um, but uh, my father was a keen amateur photographer, and I used to um, do some developing and printing with him. And uh, I got my first camera when I was about oh, 20, I suppose. I, I was a bit late, really. I think I started about 10 years earlier. I'd have got some really good shots of old blues guys. But there you go, that's life. Can I, get, can I start where, where I was born? Because it's pretty relevant. I was born in Upton on Seven in Worcestershire, uh, home of the Upton Blues Festival. And that's where I first met you, actually, when you, uh, you did a gig in there and um, you were with Mumbo Jumbo at the time. Did some sets with them, if you recall. Um, but when I was about five years old, my parents moved to uh, Birmingham. And that's where I went to school. And my, I started in being involved with uh, blues music. At that time, I was following the Rolling Stones and a lot of the rawness of the music. Um, and I started to buy a lot of the Rolling Stones records. And the, 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 my favourite ones were always the bluesy type ones. But I didn't realise that at the time. I didn't know what blues was. Uh, and of, of course, there was no internet, no computer, so you couldn't find out much about the background of the music, but I was fascinated by some of the names. And um, names like uh, Johnson, Dixon, Wilkins, they meant nothing to me, but they're American blues guys, but I, I didn't know. And on Saturday mornings, I used to go into uh, Birmingham, into the record store there, and just browse through the records and found some sample of blues records, which um, I used to collect. And then, of course, I got hooked on Muddy Waters and the like. And that's when I started in blues. Uh, and my first ever bluesy type record, I suppose, was a Chuck Berry record, actually. A friend at school had been to America on holiday. They came back with this record. I darted with him and he, 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 he let me buy it off it anyway. And uh, I was fascinated by this and the American sound. Anyway, that's what we went to blues music. When I was a teenager, um, after I sort of left school, and um, uh, I used to go to a mother's club in Birmingham, which is a favourite haunt. I used to go three or four nights a week. And it was all uh, the time progressive music, uh, bluesy type, R&B, that sort of stuff. But we saw some wonderful musicians there. And that's when I wished I'd have been involved in more photography, because I saw the likes of Pink Floyd, John Mills, Blues Breakers, Can't Heat, Fleetwood Mac, Muddy Waters, all these guys were appearing at Mother's Club. Because I, I was, although I saw them, I didn't have a camera at the time, so I didn't get any photos of them, which is a great shame. But I'd, I'd love to have uh, got some of those old guys. Anyway, um, I went to um, the Bath uh, Festival of Blues and Progressive Music in 1970. There, so another rather interesting batch of musicians, Canty, uh, Eve Hartley, Jefferson Airplane, Dr. John, Ned Zeppelin, John Mayo, all these sort of people. But again, didn't have a camera. And I saw a last time to photography more after I'd seen all these, which is a bit late, but there you go. <laughs> um, let me think of... Uh, no, I, can't, I can't think the actual age I was when I started. But... On the um, blue side, I'll, I'll come into more photography in a minute and I'll show you. But I'd like to give you the background of uh, get, getting involved in the blues. It was in the 1990s I came across uh, an appreciation of blues for a part-time course, which I went on. And I met a guy called Max Haynes, who's a historian. And he's been a lifelong friend ever since. Uh, and he's a... Uh, written articles about blues and uh, doing these courses. It's really interesting. 
anyway, um, after a year or two of going on these courses, and uh, Max started up a, a um, blues session, blues club, and uh, I attended the first one, and we talked at the time how we could promote this. And I think, how about if I built a website for both the evolution of uh, earlyblues.com, which was uh, set up in October 2000, which has been going ever since. And it started really to promote that blues club and also to actually publish articles and essays on blues music, which uh, was very interesting to do. Um, and that's when I sort of latched on to, well, if I start attending these gigs, um, pick up a camera and start taking photos. And so that's when the photography started. And uh, to date, I've got about, in the region of 70,000 photos on that website. It is absolutely massive. Absolutely massive. There's about 1,200 web pages on there. So it's, it's enormous. Um, and for anybody listening, just browsing, you always find something of interest. And yeah, Tom, there's lots of photos of you on there as well, with the various bands. Well, we'll put a link on, we'll put a link on to earlyblues.org. So it'll come on. Yeah, there's two websites now. It's earlyblues.com and earlyblues.org. And there's an earlygospel.com. Yeah, yeah. Um, the first website was earlyblues.com. But it got that big, I had to break it into two. So there's earlyblues.org, which is all history side. So essays, articles, um, all about the history of the blues. And then the main site has got the photography on it. Um, there's a sister website, which is uh, earlygospel.com, which is the history of gospel music up until the Second World War. Uh, um, there's a, a website, a research website called uh, Underground Railroad Doll, which talks about going back to slavery times, and not so much the music, more the abolitionist and uh, freedom of slaves. And various other websites associated with them. We've got Alan White Photography, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I started to get a big website, but I do. I actually run 14 websites. Blimey. Well. <laughs> yeah. I won't get through them all, boy. Well, they're the four I can find. Yeah. Well, there's plenty more. Uh, Carlisle Blues Festival. If you look at that, that's mine. I, I help um, Nick Westcott, the organiser. And uh, for my bit, I'll do the website for him. Um, but he, he he needs a lot of support. He gets he gets some funding, but not a great deal. And so the more help as he gets, the better. So I've been doing that for a few years. And of course, a lot of my photography goes on other sites as well, which is interesting stuff. And as an aside, um, last year, Virgin Trains got in touch with me and said, could they use the logo of the website for publicity? Of, uh, to represent Carlisle as, as a city, but they do a series of, in their magazine of destinations on Virgin Trains, and they chose Carlisle. And uh, my photo of the Carlisle Blues Festival um, was, the, was the logo they used, which is rather nice. What does photography mean to you? Uh, it's, it's really um, memories. It's... Uh, a statement in time, you're seeing, say, I mean, I do concentrate just in live music and mainly these festivals, uh, uh, but it's recording that moment in time uh, to get the um, the artist on stage doing their thing. It's it's a big challenge to get a decent photo anyway. It's basically you're taking photos of people that aren't posing to take a photo. They're moving around doing uh, their session. Uh, the lighting is always flickering, going, changing all the time. Uh, everybody's moving around. It, uh, and it's quite a tricky thing to do, but it's fun. What's your f- favourite lens? Uh, 70 to 200, that sort of size, in a 35mm format. I actually use Olympus cameras now because they're much, they're much lighter. Um, but the, the equivalent of a 70 to 2, 70 to 210. Which is the best test for um, uh, festival photography because you don't have to stand right in front of the stage. You can go right back and say you're not getting anybody's way. But the worst thing of all for photography is to block people's view. 
what advice would you have for shooting an artist in poor light? Sort of aperture, shutter speed? Well, there's different opinions on the best way to do it, but I always use shutter speed priority. Um, and uh, I, the tricks of the trade, basically, you've got to know your artist, you've got to know the song they're singing. And if you watch them uh, more than once to get a decent shot, you know where they're going to be on stage, because they always do the same routines to a particular song. And that, there's one or two artists that I know will go to say the right of the stage when they send a certain, certain song. And uh, what it comes to line now, it always bends down and looks at the audience in one of the um, one of the lines in the song. And I always position myself just for that moment as he bends down, sings the song, kick, I've got the photo. So familiarising yourself with the artist. Yeah, yeah, the artist. And the, the way, because all artists tend to stand the same place on stage each time. You know, you can stand somewhere that you can, you know you're going to get a good angle shot, not straight in front of them, but a 45 degree angle. And do you ever use auto settings? No. No. Uh, mainly because you know, the subject you're taking is always moving, so you need a high speed. It varies on the lighting, of course, and uh, it can't give guidance too well because... Um, the lighting is constantly changing, so you're always looking around and getting a feel for the lighting and changing the settings the whole time. And your focus is the shutter speed? Yeah. Yeah, shutter speed. Yeah. And what's your workflow for editing? I mean, what software do you use? I use PaintShop Pro. Um, I, most people use Photoshop, but I use PaintShop Pro because I always have to, uh, since it was a, a free product. And uh, I just stop I mean, I know it well, and it does uh, equally uh, a similar job to Photoshop. Uh, it's a bit cheaper, especially these days, because you have to sort of rent. Um, I'm, I'm so used to it. I uh, don't do that much editing anyway. Is this the things you do to every picture? Is it like music? No, not every picture, no. It's, normally, you do a bit of cropping because you've got maybe somebody in the background you don't want or just crop it down a bit uh, make it more interesting photo that way so this the effects you see are normally caught in the moment yes yes that's the idea to get those those shots i uh i've got some i'll show you this some actual photos as examples uh, there's one i took of um steve cropper steve cropper came over to england as a guest of the animals, and uh, the animals were touring around, he went round with them. He was on a bit of a holiday, and he just guested a few, few uh, songs now and again. And um, I took that photo of one of those gigs, and uh, it went viral, basically, because Steve liked it so much. He actually used it as a header on his website, which I thought was a great accolade. Cold Blue Festival created a big sexual poster of it and had it on the wall of the main hall. So things like that, they're, they're interesting. What year was that? Yeah. Good, good question. Uh, early 2000, 2005, something like that. Oh, that's a good date. <laughs> Among all your work, what's your favourite and why? Photography, you mean? Yes. Mm. Have you got one photo that? Well, that one I that one I like because uh, it it did so well. Um, uh, so few of them have done very well. Um, one of uh, Lisa Mills, the uh, American uh, female singer uh, from um, Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, somewhere down that way. Um, she came over to the UK and did a festival, Maryport Festival, I think it was. Yes, it was. And uh, it was the first time, I think it was the first time she'd come over. I took a photo of her and uh, it got into um, Blues Matters magazine. It actually went on the front cover alongside a photo of Robert Plant. And she was overjoyed with that. And uh, it's just a casual photo, nothing particular, but it just, it just worked. It's, it's nice when you get that sort of thing happen. Whose work has influenced you? 
Dick Waterman. Um, he's been a record, um, a blues uh, record. I think he's a producer. He's certainly a blues photographer in the old school. He took some seminal photos of uh, the likes of Mississippi John Hennett, um, Sun House. It was hidden that I had three, three fellows that actually found the Sun House uh, some years after his popularity waned, and they reinstated him as where he should be. Um, I mean, he got some wonderful photos. I actually went a my trip to the States. We went to where he lives in Oxford, Mississippi, and uh, I called him and uh, asked would it be possible to meet him. And he was actually being interviewed by some uh, uh, chap from New York doing a TV show with him. But uh, he led me to go along and uh, he spent about three hours going through all his photography. Wonderful stuff, absolutely wonderful. What's the one thing you wish you knew when you started out taking photos? When you started taking it seriously, what is the one thing you, you know, wish you knew? Well, the one thing I wished is I'd taken photos not earlier than I did. Because <laughs> some of the things I've seen would never get a chance again. It's that moment in time, you know, you, yeah. know, you get one chance of doing these things at the right place at the right time. And you, you can be saying it's such a loss. What about what advice would you give yourself if you could go back? Don't carry too much equipment. It's quite <laughs> often when, it, when you're in festivals, you're in a crowded room, uh, it's hot and sweaty. You've got a very heavy camera on your shoulder. And quite often I used to carry two cameras, umpteen lenses, all, all on the <laughs> hurt your shoulder after a while. What do you carry with you then for a festival? Well, these, these days I just carry the uh, one lens. One, one camera, one lens. One camera, one lens. Yeah, 72, 10 lens. But if it's um, an important session, I'll carry the two, two uh, bodies and uh, two lenses uh, already set up, uh, never switch the lenses on one camera in, uh, in situ. Always have the two cameras together. Do you have a shooting strategy for taking photos of artists? It's knowing the artist and knowing the sort of songs they're going to do. Uh, quite often I'll chat to them before they go on stage, find out what's on the set list so I know what to look out for. Um, and then I'll plan some photos around what they're actually performing. Uh, who's, who's also in the band? Because, you know, obviously the substitute, uh, uh, substitute drummers or something like that. And, um, you know, if they're using a particular drummer, I've not got any photos of, then I'll make sure that I'll, I'll get some good photos of that drummer. Uh, what is your favourite subject to photograph? Is it gigs or wildlife? Or? Yeah, it's live music. Musicians like you on stage. <laughs> um, and what inspires you? It's a, it's a challenge because, uh, as I said before, the uh, the elements of the photography are uh, so variable. It's a challenge to get a good shot. It all depends on the venue, the lighting, the crowd. Um, how can you get the right angle for the shot you want? Uh, one of the key factors with uh, live music photography, particularly in um, festivals where it's crowded, is you keep out of the way of the punters. Keep a, a safe distance so that um, you're not standing in front of anybody and you're not blocking the view for more than a few seconds. And if you do have to ask the permission to be okay for the stunts stand here want to take a photo, then move away quickly so you're not upsetting people. But the worst thing in the world is to walk along there with a the tripod, just put it in the middle, and try and take a photo of blocking people's view for a while. Uh, oh, oh, you know, people don't take too kindly to them, quite <laughs> rightly. Do you, um, what's the, uh, like the rights of photography, of photographing people? Is it, are you able to just go in and just photograph anybody or do you have to ask them first or? Normally anybody, um, uh, uh, should we say, in the majority of the blue scene, uh, all bands and artists are only too willing for you to take photos of them because they can basically offer the photos and so they can use them for promotional material, uh, CD covers, uh, that sort of thing. And the venues like to use photos to promote the venue and the festivals. But there are certain artists, the bigger the name, the more difficult it becomes 
you did need to get permission from the management or the artists themselves. Um, one of the classic difficult ones is Van Morrison. He always starts his sessions by no photography at all. And he has uh, security then wandering around watching people so that they're not taking photos with their um, smartphones, things like that. Normally, a big name will say photos are just the first three numbers, and that's it. But I did, um, I've done a few uh, sessions at um, Chicago Blues Festival uh, over the years, um, and there, you, to get a press pass is quite a difficult thing. Um, I've known people spend 12 months trying to get a press pass. Uh, fortunately, because of uh, my blues background, um, I uh, got in touch with them and uh, showed them the work that I do. They looked at earlyblues.com and came back within 24 hours. I got a press pass. So that was good. And then, of course, you're in the press pit, and so you're right up in front of about 15,000 people. Uh, and you get the good angles, you've got the space then. A the place like that, they're very strict with photographers. Even if you've got a press pass, if they don't think your camera is professional enough, they'll kick you out. So, um, you know, you've got to be a bona fide uh, press photographer in order to get that pass and keep it. And you've done some other travels of America, didn't you? Did you do Memphis? And... I've been to, yeah, yeah, I've done about um, 25 states of America. You know, I've been all over, really, on various trips. I did about for about 10 years, I was doing five, six weeks a year in America. You know, not all blue stuff, just holidays touring around. But I was I'd always had a camera with me. Um, I'll tell you a little story about a famous um, trip I did. Uh, I was with a friend photographer, and we were just uh, chilling out, sitting in a bar. I think we were sitting on the floor at a pint. And um, uh, his uh, uh, disabled uh, fella, Stays tall, um, and he's always in a wheelchair. And uh, he said to me, "Do you know I've always wanted to do Route 66?" And uh, he said, oh, "I've got his brother lives in Chicago, uh, the start of uh, the route." Uh, but he said, "Oh no, I'll never be able to do it because I can't get an adapted car across there, and I can't hire one like that." And I said, "You know, that's funny. I always wanted to do that." And uh, I said, "Come on then, let's book it. Let's go." And he said. You don't mean it. I said, I do. And he said, but I've got a wheelchair. I said, I, I had a great friend with a wheelchair. I used to car around for ages. So uh, we we flew to Los Angeles and did Route 66 as a photography trip. It took us four weeks. And we ended up in Chicago. Then we went to the Shanghai Birds Festival. So, so it was actually in seven weeks in all. <laughs> so it was quite a big trip. Where does it start? Where did you start? Yeah, because I know it's in Chicago, but... It's in Chicago, yeah. Where's the other South end? South Michigan Avenue. Uh, the other end is uh, Santa Monica Beach, Los Angeles. Uh, but we did it in reverse, so all the guidebooks, we had to read backwards. <laughs> so all the guidebooks go from Chicago to LA. So we did LA to Chicago. And the idea was to get back on the, on the day of the festival. What was your best section of it? The uh, most picturesque, I suppose, was the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon isn't actually on Route 66, but you can't go 100 miles near the Grand Canyon without actually doing a detour and going to it. I've been there before, but Paul hadn't. And uh, we went up to the edge, and he looked down and he said, I think I went the bunt. <laughs> it's really awesome, really. It does take your breath away. And it I took seven it weeks. Well, I mean, the whole trip took to a long time. Yes. I did basically went from LA to Chicago, drove all the way there, and then I spent uh, a couple of weeks in Chicago. Um, wonderful place, by the way. Uh, then on to um, where to go there? Uh, Cincinnati. Then caught the Amtrak train across to New York, where the wife Christine came and joined me. And we were a holiday in uh, New York and Washington. But I was, um, I, the train trip from Cincinnati to New York took uh, 21 hours. It was a hell of a journey. But that's a good photography on the way. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you have with you? What camera? Canon. The Canon. It was Canon 450D at the time. I mean, it's not one day that don't make it. 
but that, that served me well. In fact, I'd only been in the chip for about three or four days, and I chipped and fell. But as I was falling down, I saw the camera go in front of me and bounce onto the ground. Oh, no. So I thought, that's it, I'm, I'm stuffed, basically. But it, it, it survived fine, it was, it was perfectly okay. And how many lenses well, do you have with you? Probably three, I would think, no more than that. Because, you know, you've got to carry it around all the time and uh, you're just losing it. You know, we stay in one night, one night stands and places and uh, yeah, often you didn't actually unpack, you just lived out of your suitcase. So the, the lighter it was, the better. Okay. What lenses would they be? Wide angle, uh, uh, yes, it's not, I guess it's not, I can't remember. <laughs> but a wide angle, a small telephoto and um, standard lens. What makes a good picture stand out from an average one? Something of interest, something that, you know, anybody looking at the picture uh, can pick up on. Maybe um, an artist on stage uh, performing at a uh, type of a position that they're in almost what's on the ceiling by the, by the way they're standing. The classic one is um, Dr. Feelgood, I mean, the singer there, uh, Robert. He, um, He's quite amazing on stage, the uh, gyrations that he does with the sort of music. So he's very good. And uh, there's set various bands like that, the singers uh, posing. Well, they're not posing, they're just performing. And it's to capture that performance and uh, people can, can then appreciate um, the work that they do on stage. They're not just standing there rigid, trying the guitar. They're moving around and uh, uh, they're... It, it's, but, can be very uh, attractive the way that they pose, basically, to the music that they performing. And what's the most rewarding part of being a photographer for you? Um, at festivals, when you go to press pass, uh, obviously they, uh, they let you backstage and you can meet the artists. And that's very rewarding. Uh, some lovely stories of uh, backstage stuff. It's very... Like um, casual, shall we say, where the artist is either waiting to perform or it's just finished and he's in the green room. And it, it's been able to have a chat and whatever. That started me doing interviews um, with artists. Uh, not just talking to them about the photography I'm doing, but talking to them as a proper interview. So I did, I've, on the website, there's about 120 interviews I've done. Most of those are just sit backstage in the casual, you know, setting. The sort of stories there in the interviews, um, Sid Cropper comes to mind. Uh, the first time he was over in, in the UK, he uh, appeared at a coal festival. And I was staying at the same hotel that he was staying at. He was at the bar, and I prepared myself to uh, ask him to uh, do an interview. So I went up to him and tapped him on the shoulder. And he's a big guy, and I was a bit uh, apprehensive. I said, do you mind spending 10, 15 minutes to do an interview? And he said, uh, he looked at me, no, he said, no, no, I'm not spending 10 or 15 minutes interviewing. I said, well, fair enough, you know, I understand that, you know, you're busy man, you're probably tired, whatever. He said, let's do an hour and a half. Because basically, he said, I can't talk to you about that short of time, but I spent some time on it. And then we spent an hour and a half of this interview. And he's a wonderful chap, really good, really good. Other than your camera and your lens, what are what other two most important things in your camera case? The um, oh, let's think. I used to carry a lot of kit that I didn't really need. I you know, just strip it down, especially when you're um, moving around a festival, because basically you don't want your stuff mixed, and uh, um, you just carry basically a couple of camera bodies. Two or three lenses, um, give it to that. And plenty of, uh, <laughs> plenty of storage. Because <laughs> I've been known to take 4,000 photos at a festival. So, uh, yeah, you do need a lot of uh, SD cards. What made you use SD cards? Uh, Sound disk, um, mainly, I uh, have in the past. Um, they average, um, 
I've never had any Do you recommend carrying more than uh, more than two batteries, or? I always have a set of spare batteries, fully charged. So um, the worst thing in the world is to run out of juice. Uh, it's to, to be in the middle of a, a long uh, set, uh, band you really want to get some photos of, and, you, and the battery runs out. <laughs> it's but mind blowing. <laughs> So, um, as well as the two camera boys, professional style uh, cameras, I always have in my pockets the compact camera, just in case. So there's always my little thing in the pocket, you put it out and it looks naff, but at least you've got something to get an image. Probably not much better with the lighting or whatever, but you know, a snapshot doing that way can be better than nothing. And you might be lucky, you know, never know. Or these days, of course, on, on a smartphone, you know, you've got, you've got that opportunity. Yeah, well, I suppose if you run out of juice, you have to start dancing if you're right at the front of the stage. <laughs> dancing and me don't get on. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the side of it. What about earplugs as well? Earplugs? Um, yes. Uh, I, I, I professional I can uh, imagine, earplugs. Yeah. Yeah, same as musicians do. Obviously, you have to on stage because of you know, the noise, whatever. Um, but when you stand in front of a set of speakers, <laughs> with the loss of you banging away on your guitar, yeah. Um, yeah, topping it about six inches from the <laughs> speaker, you do need earplugs. <laughs> it's quite often the best shot of what the shot taken standing in front of these speakers at an angle. I said before, they're normally the best shots. You don't stand there too long. <laughs> Who's your favourite blues artist? Modern day or old style? That's, that's your call. Modern, yeah, okay. Modern day, it's got to be in Siegel. Um, I mean, it's, uh, he's just got, he's got it in style. It's blues is concerned. In the old style, um, and the song I like him to play the most is. Mary Don't You Wait, which is more of a gospel number, but he does it so well. Um, every time I see him, I say, come on, you're going to play that, are you? So, uh, yeah. And what about but, old school? Uh, old school, Mississippi John Hurt, I like, he's a country blues man, very laid back. It's all country style music, but uh, some nice stories going with the songs. It's all about old blues men sang songs that were actually stories. Uh, those sort of things are nice. Nice Sun House, Charlie Parton, uh, the biggest, biggest. I actually got a, um, I got a, an old bio I did. I'll send it to you. Um, it's got a list there of uh, all the artists I like. Also, my play, um, maybe Staples was the best performance I've ever seen on stage. But I witnessed men cry as they were watching it. There's a passion in a voice. It's, it's gospel stuff, but uh, uh, it was very, very evocative, very moving. Tremendous stuff. Yeah, I saw some of her on a on a TV program. She's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's yeah, a. She, yeah. They did a live story where they followed her around. Yeah, yeah. She did uh, call call R B festival some years ago, and that's when I got to meet her. I, I didn't get a chance to interview her, which is a shame, but uh, sometimes you're all prepared for these interviews and it just doesn't happen. You know, they're, they're out of time or, you know, they jump straight into a car and drive off. What would be your Desert Island disc? Ooh. Good question. I think. Uh, I think. you got to look. <laughs> I got a little, I got a there was an article in the magazine some years ago about uh, 12, what's it called? 12 memories or something. Um, 12 memorable moments. Yeah. And uh, you had to name CDs, DVDs, that sort of thing that you liked. Uh, of the... I mentioned Ian Siegel doing Mary Days a Week as a performance. But the CD, uh, Prayer Songsters, which is again Mississippi John Hurt, uh, Skip James, uh, 
The early recordings of Steve James, Washington Feds, Gospel. It's probably a pretty easy put a dozen albums together. And the Birds of Eye, Desert Island, which I'm doing now in shutdown anyway. <laughs> Just play it all the time. So it'll be a mixed album. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, very much. Mixed album. Blues of Gospel. What is the name of that gospel act? Washington Phillips. Washington Fifths. Phillips. P H I W L I P S. Phillips. Washington Phillips. What books are you reading at the moment? Uh, a book on uh, Frederick Douglass, the uh, abolitionist. Uh, and um, he was uh, a state slave and uh, became an orator. He toured. Yes, American, but he toured Britain as well, campaigning for the end of slavery. And in the end, he became um, very close to uh, uh, the uh, Washington elite, shall we say, and um, did work very well. He's a very well-respected man. He's a very thick book as well. <laughs> There's taken you a while to read. Regarding the music, do you buy downloads or are you more a CDs man or? Well, I'm a CDs man really. Um, I've got about a thousand blue CDs, uh, racks of them, mainly uh, document, document records because uh, that's the best uh, album for blues, but the old style blues, uh, the modern style you've got the likes of alligator records. Um, labels like that, overcoming new people. Um, I admire the work they're allocated to do. Uh, they've been for years. And uh, Doctrine Records, um, as I say, it's the bread and butter of the old Blue Star. Uh, I think I've got about 800 document records. So I think I'm, I can say to say I'm their best customer. But yeah, with the because everything's moving more digital, I just wondered if yeah. you moved with it or if you. Uh, I'm moving that way. It's like moving to digital photography. You're hesitant, but you, you, you end up there. Um, and even document records don't produce physical CDs anymore. Uh, they just do downloads. Uh, and and yes, I, I do that. But I, I still like having the CD in the hand. Are you on Spotify or the Amazon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Spotify. Um, and I pay for um, Amazon as well. So, uh, you know, just sit in the lounge and ask for a record and play in the other Alexa, Spotify. play Mississippi John Hurt. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that's great. I can't hear it. <laughs> Uh, how would you describe the British blues scene over the past two to three years? Basically, uh, struggling because um, without people going to gigs, festivals, um, the live music scene struggles. Um, it's always been the case that uh, it needs the people behind the scenes to um, help artists. Um, if I take just a, a, any blues festival, um, they struggle to get sponsorship. Uh, they struggle to get the numbers behind the door, through the doors. Uh, the artists uh, obviously struggling with their um, tours. It's a hard job. So, uh, I mean, this um, this year is not helping. It, uh, you know. And what do you think is going to happen when we come out of this? Well, hopefully people will return to enjoy live music. I know that there's a lot of down uh, streaming going on. A lot of musicians, all they can do is go on Facebook and play a song a day, that sort of thing, or other things like what you're doing now. But uh, an artist's home is on stage. Live music is so important. And hopefully people will return. Really hope so. And what does live music mean for you? Enjoyment, um, seeing something fresh. Each performance is different. Uh, any festival you go to is a selection of all different styles. It's no good to go and somebody go and say, oh, it's not blues or it's not this, it's not. It's always a mixture. So that people can come away and say, oh, I really enjoyed X, Y, Z band. I didn't think as much as so-and-so. 
but that's it. Everybody's different. The important thing is uh, that people know to get enjoyment out of it. And it's, and it's different to just recording music all the time. And you've got a camaraderie. Uh, there's a lot of blues fans. They all know each other because they travel the country and go into all these festivals. There's hardcore that consistently going around listening to the live music or fo- following their favourite artists. But normally it's just to go to a festival. It's not just the music, it's the camaraderie of the people. That's so important. Are you a member of the, um, or on the committee of the Blues Federation? Yeah, um, Ashwin Smythe, who's the chairman, um, he had the idea of starting the UK Police Federation. And uh, he emailed me one day and said, Do I, did I want to join him uh, along with I think it was six of the staff uh, to set up a board to start this up, which uh, we did. And uh, I was on the board as an active member for nearly five years, and I've now stepped back from the day to day. Um, there's what they call an emeritus board member, so I concentrate on the history and the archiving. So all the all the archiving of the UK Blues Federation is on earlyblues.com. And uh, is the UK Blues Award separate to the Federation? Uh, the UK Blues Awards is run by the Federation. Right, okay. In fact, the, this year is the second one. Uh, there wasn't one last year. The, the first one was two years ago. And... Um, uh, we decided to go ahead with it based on the fact that uh, the British Blues uh, Awards um, run by uh, Sue and uh, Tony, they were struggling and they, they were struggling because of uh, the problems of making it um, secure. And uh, this was a challenge and um, we worked very hard behind the scenes to get an awards that was going to be secure it's going to be well run. We haven't actually had uh, KPMG auditors uh, audit everything we were doing to make sure it was seen as fair and uh, it's secure because there's no point in people voting and then you get automatic votes come through and suddenly uh, XYZ band has got 3,000 votes more than they should have because uh, the uh, fiddling that might go on. So we we're very conscious of that. We spend an awful long time getting that right in the first place. So is it just members that vote? No, no, it's the public. The public can do it online. There is, uh, it starts off with a nomination panel. Uh, the nomination panel are uh, people from the industry in the main. Um, they put forward a, a, their selection of who they think should be up for an award. And then the, um, the shortlist is made of that, and that shortlist then goes public, and then the public have the vote. Uh, it's it's a, behind the scenes. It's very well run, and um, it's uh, very interesting. In fact, the uh, awards are coming up this Sunday. Coming by the time this goes out, it already happened. But um, it, of course, it's got to be. Um, a virtual awards this year. It's supposed to be in London, in Camden, but uh, obviously it can't happen this year, so it's all been done, uh, streamed on YouTube. Uh, but they've got some big names. Uh, Paul Jones is uh, being the MC. Um, for the first awards, it was Ian Siegel. Um, uh, there's a lot of guests, uh, presenters, and a lot of bands involved uh, playing. So it's a big, big event. But it'll all have happened by the time you hear this. <laughs> well, what I normally do, Alan, is do a quick fire question at the end. So just try not to think too much and say what, what comes into oh. your head. Okay. Yeah. So Olympus or Canon? Olympus. <laughs> Logic or creativity? Creativity. In or outside the box? Outside the box. Heaven or hell? Heaven. Odd or even? Odd. What's needed or what's right? What's right? And what's the first thing you grab in the morning when you wake up? My phone. (laughs) 
Thank you, Val. <laughs> Hey, it's Tommy Allen from TommyAllenMusic.com and that was Alan White. If you'd like to find out more about Alan and his photography, please go to earlyblues.com or earlyblues.org. There'll be a link at the end of this with all his other websites too where you can check him out. Next week, we have the blues rock guitarist, Mr. Ben Paul, right here on Tommy Allen Music. So come and check that out. Until then, please give us a like, hit the subscribe button. Until next week, a worth my director. Yeah.